Welcome to the launch of Black Balloon. This is, thank you for the cheer, marvellous. Um, an anthology which has been curated by students on the MA in Creative Writing at Nottingham Trent University. Uh, it's an anthology of almost completely new writing by emerging writers and more established <coughs> artists. Uh, my name, by the way, is Michelle Taylor and I'm your MC for the evening. Bill Thorpe, 2013. When she rang the bell, I really was up to my oxfords between six different, pulled from pillar. So it wasn't a lie to say I didn't have time to buy or offer an upturned palm for forecast of doom or happiness, depending on her taking of me. And she took it well, looked me down and up, saw the day's stress in the falling hair grips, the mess of mud and straw on knees, the top lip only pink stain and smeary specks. But I was ready for her. I'd rehearsed, was quite prepared to catch her curse and blow it back through tunneled fist with a gentle whisper to be careful who you mess with. Thank you. From each fat coin, spindles rooted and tugged at the shore wind, and some of the tips clipped off in his small hands like rills of wax, but it didn't matter. Then, candy floss smothered his face, its hairs in his hair, as they leaned through the gusts at the tip of the pier, a hand in Papa's jacket pocket, scrunching his sweet-smelling cigarette packet. Sixty years ago, that. But part of now for him last week, when he was calling for more water, or for mother, too gone to understand but still going, hard blooms blooming through the gut. So passing wasn't to dwell on. And as the small troop passes the home, his elm box propping dad in cut chrysanthemums, the gruff sons tight to their tight-lipped mum, no one else notices or minds that they've taken down his blinds. And writhing from nub torsos across the sand, spindles root and tug at the shore wind. Thank you. It will be four years before the stomach acid stops rotting your teeth, but the taste will burn in your throat for much longer. Ignore this. There are veins on your legs in the shape of ribbons, and men and women will press themselves against these as if to suffocate themselves. Ignore these. Pay attention to the smooth flesh you have and cherish it. By this point, you've already made too much of your body. You will make yourself run from the lamppost to the house with the green door in approximately 7.4 seconds. And if you don't, you'll replicate the cracks in the pavement on your wrists. You'll learn that scar tissue is softer than normal skin, and maybe that is why, four years later, even more of your body is covered in it. There will be no bed sheets in your possession that aren't stained with blood. You'll still find different excuses each time. No one is fooled by you wearing long sleeves in the heat of July. Do not pretend your heart is as bare as a thunderstruck branch in January, because the grooves in your legs tell a different story. They will heal quicker if you open up and shed your old skin. There is more light in you than you think, but a lamp is no use when it's hidden in a drawer. Drink up the morning sun. You don't know it yet, but there will come a time at 3 a.m., four days before your 20th birthday, with the realisation that you may never see another sunrise. The screams of your best friend will be pervading your ears. She's covered in your blood. It's the first time you've ever seen her cry. Thank you. Um, so, empty. True elixirs of life are beautiful poisons of gold. You drink, you drink the red, the pink, you glug, you sip your empty words, but trust is glass and glass will break. 
Distill my pain in scarred, forsaken barrels. See them wither, flake, and shed. These reptile eyes betray my cries, my innocence mere inches from dead. Murder these internal things, this simple flesh that I decay like dear life. To death the mould of future cold, show me not your shining knife. Those icy spears which numb the heart and reheat it under lust. Get up, be gone, she's not the one. Care quickly turns to dust, and dust gets swept as gloves get glugged. Fancy another? Oh no, no, I shouldn't. Go on then, cheers! Such madness outweighs my pressing fears. For madness comes with laughter, how cunning, how cruel, yet magnificent, that long untamed force of need that slithers slowly, surely to skull and bites hard to give euphoric loss of all. By night a cackle, come day I hear it echo through an empty cage of ribs containing but a cheery ghost. Thank you. Um, Black Balloon has the uh, privilege of having a foreword written by Jenny Seeley. Now Jenny, if you don't know, Jenny Seeley MBE I should say, Jenny is artistic director of Grey Eye Theatre Company and was one of the two people responsible for directing the opening ceremony of the Paralympic Games in London 2012. And I just want to read one of the paragraphs that Jerry, Je, uh, Jenny wrote for her foreword, because um, for, for me, coming, um, coming cold to, to the collection and um, reading, reading bits of it and wanting to read all of it, this sums up what you get from this collection. The writers have dug deep into their psyche and have not shied away from the chaos and stillness of grief or the shattering of a life or the science of a soul. They take you through the circle of life and every word matters. And I'm sure from what we've heard so far this evening, you'd agree. In 1904, my 17th year, I woke one morning to find that a storm had won hard on the roof of the hay barn. I took to my ladder, and though the height was no bother to me, the hot air was dizzying. I'd lived in Oklahoma all my life and was sure that no other state could boast some heat like ours. After an hour or so, I set down my tools, took care to find stable seating, and looked out across our lands. We were deep into the summer. The crop stood high and the sun cast its heavy smile across the fields. I'd never seen the barley shine so vain as on that morning, and all at once I felt the need to be down there, among it all. Then I caught sight of her. Miss Marie was seated on the ground, her arms clutched tightly across her chest and her head bowed low. She'd never let her sadness show so plainly before, and the sight of it shook me. I knew that Pa would tell me to let it alone, that until she asked for help it wasn't none of our business. But how could I leave a poor girl crying so? I climbed down from the roof of the hay barn and walked over to her bent body. Even out here on the farm I'd heard the stories of her past fists and her ma's poison. The closer I drew, the clearer I saw the rank purple bruises spread heavy over her milky skin. I took off my cap and slowed my step as I was wont to do when hunting rabbits. Miss Marie? She looked up at the sound of my voice to reveal wet eyes. Her hair was a dull red flame, matted and hardened with neglect. But nothing could pal that face. Do you want me to leave? She asked. No, I answered quickly. I saw you sat so, well, so sad and all, and I just wondered if you might like something to drink on such a hot day. She looked surprised at my offer, and I remembered that many town folk were wary of such kindness. By the many enemies her pa had made, she was probably more used to hate than help. I'm a pretty good listener and all, I continued. Come
comes from all those long talks with the cattle, I suppose. Wouldn't that make you more of a talker, she said, looking me over. Oh no. I took a step closer. That's a common mistake amongst townsfolk. You never know how much an animal has to say until you take the time to listen. I sat down opposite her. In times of need, you won't might find any man much wiser than a billy goat. Her eyes scanned the space, remembering it had once been her playground, a space for the imagination. The dens that had been created, the stories imagined, the lives lived out in summer's never ending. Where were the trees they'd climbed? Where were the bushes that danced around? Where were the voles, the foxes, field mice they'd watched? Listen. The stream sounds subdued in plastic piping. Where's the bird song? Where's the horse? A colour-drained, cracked concrete expanse and disused factory faced her. Back then, the stains on our fingers had been from berry juice. Um, this is a poem called Gravy, but it's not about gravy. The jeans are soaked in gravy. Arranging the towels on their rail, there is that smell. Not of laundry, but of gravy. The dust from the drill settles in the most awkward of places. Under the window resembles a hardware, hardware store. The treacle porter tastes of treacle and darkens the glass. At night, there is the feeling of being at sea even though the bed is anchored firmly to the first floor. The council house clock is chiming ten. In ten more hours, he will walk away from the bleary row of terraced houses in Baseford. He sees himself waiting with his kit bag under the fluorescent lights of Broadmarsh bus station. Next stop, Catterick, then Cyprus, then Cambastion, another tour of Afghan with second Mercians. Stevie looks up at the buildings that are illuminated purple and to the sky and stars beyond. It must be the booze or the night air because Stevie feels he's moving. He's weightless, being lifted up. Slab square is below him. He moves further out. He looks down at the hulk of the floodlit castle, at the neat rows of streetlights spreading out from the city centre. He is propelled far out into the blue black night. The earth spins below him, the blackness wraps around Stevie. He feels safe. His memories are blanked out. Then he's falling. He's being thrown back to earth. He tries to stop, but there's nothing he can do. Have to go back one more time to a small village in Helmand on patrol at midday. He's backed against the wall waiting for Jimmy to ghost past the door of the mud bricked house. Jimmy will cover him. Stevie will shout all clear and they'll leapfrog on to the next one. Just like they've done hundreds of times before. Stevie's about to move, rifle raised, when a boy walks towards him out of nowhere. He's carrying a hemp bag on his shoulder. Piss off, Stevie hisses. The boy stands there, his brown eyes fixed on Stevie. The boy's hand reaches for the top of the bag. Jimmy shouts, the bag, Stevie, what's in the fucking bag? From the doorway, there's a flash of movement. Stevie turns and fires off a burst of three rounds. Tap, tap, tap. Everything's still. And then the screaming starts. The boy runs past Stevie to the door where a woman lies against the door frame. She's dressed in black and her hands are white with flour. There's a neat hole above her left eyebrow. Stevie looks at the bag lying on the dusty ground. Pale apricots have spilled out of the bag. 
each with a curl of leaf still attached. Stevie hears the sound of a voice from somewhere. Can you hear me? Are you alright, sir? Stevie's face down on the hard slabs. His head aches, the snot and blood on his shirt. He looks up at the paramedic kneeling beside him. Yeah, I'm okay. Stevie sits up and cradles his head in his hands. He looks around. Two officers watch him from a police van parked in the square. Their radios click and hiss across another Saturday night. A group of students are tied together at the ankles. They stagger across the square, counting as they go. One, two, three, four. One, two. I have undone nearly all the knots. As I unpick the casket of your brain, each hitch unsticks another name. Brush-footed butterflies stained with your insane pride. This is a task for a woman who knows how to weave. When flax shakes its blue cups into wind, hoik it root raw from the ground, then weight it down. Best to red flax in bog or pond, let it succumb to the persistent thumb of rot, then dry it out. Use a mallet to break the stubborn fibres, drive off the shive with a scratching knife, then get the heckle. Drag the flax across its tines, abrade and split its sinews, Strike it against a wet stone, being always improved in proportion as it is beaten. Then look at her. Are you familiar with your daughters? Fifty monarch butterflies streaming skywards. Fifty names to choose from. She cannot be my Hypernestra. Dresses poured into marble, her dancer's muscles purling through immaculate skin. Then chaos took my eldest to lay between the sheets and let her sleep, the only bed to wake white in the morning. No, she is more like a mimone, she of the golden urn, glazed with the curse of obedience, Praised as her mother's heart, Poseidon's idle dalliance, and now the spring of her uncle's tears. Her buttocks offered for cousinly lust, her crotch sheathing a hidden knife. I'm going to read a very short piece of flash fiction um, called Kleiststrasse, uh, which brings together two of my kind of pet obsessions at the moment, which are sinkholes and telephones. Kleiststrasse. I was in Berlin when the hole appeared in the pavement. Crowds gathered like rats. Then two men wheeled a rusting yellow refrigerator out of an apartment block and toppled it in. We waited for the crash, and when it came, my hair went crazy with static. A snowplow pitched in. After that, everyone started. Tellies, mattresses, hardback books, even a black bag that was still moving. That's when you called. I stood at the edge, dropped my phone into the sinkhole, just to find out how long you would ring. Sometimes, if I press my ear to the gutter, I still hear you prattling. This stretch of ocean was no different from any other to his young crewmen. But for Gamel, the mist that rose off these cobalt waves carried the echoes of 22 years ago. The darkest day for Captain Gamel and his Dylan Rooney. The day his son went over. The day he lost his eldest. These coordinates were alien 
uncharted for decades. Numbers and grids he had painstakingly avoided all this time, and now a gold rush just before Christmas, unheard of. If he were alone, or with only Malcolm for company, he would have set home before now, turned around long ago. But for young Tommy and Stuart, the black gold meant thick wage packets, and for their sake, he had let us slip away, past the warning signs, into parts of the map that turned him hollow, into the darkness. The howling winds and crashing waves against the bow side were constant reminders of what had followed in the moments after his son had gone overboard. Gemmell could still hear Malky's desperate voice in the frosted air on that fateful day, his exhausted tone sounding tiny against the elements. Genius gone over, genius gone over, like a song lyric, a never-ending chorus in Gemmell's mind. He shook his head quickly, shaking off the initial sharp edges of the memory. Properly, boys. I can see from here those nets are slacking. Tighter now. Tighter. Thank you, Paul. That was Paul Davy reading from Black Gold, and there is only one way to find out what happens at the end of that story. Guess what? You need to get the book. What a treat. What we've heard this evening is just a small portion of some of the rich writing that's in this collection. So thank you to all our contributors. Thank you very much for being a great audience. Thank you. Good night.